Welcome to Podcast on Tech Nation. This is a series of podcasts focused specifically on the biomedical and HTM industry. Episodes will be added monthly. Listening to each episode is eligible for one CE credit from the ACI. At the conclusion of this episode, you'll be able to access a survey that will appear under this episode's title. You'll be able to download your certificate once you submit the survey. Before we begin today's podcast, I'd like to invite you to save the date for our Spring MD Expo. We will be in Las Vegas from April the 7th to the 9th, 2024. So for more information and event details, please visit mdexposhow.com. Podcast on Technation would like to thank our sponsor, Contact.io. Contact.io optimizes processes and resources by revealing how patients and equipment move through the care delivery. Using AI, IoT, and RTLS, Contact.io helps health systems uncover waste, streamline capacity, improve workflows, and make staff and patients feel safer, seen, and valued. Their asset management solution enables use cases such as device search for patient care, preventative maintenance, PAR level management, and loss prevention. The cloud-based IT-friendly platform can easily scale into other offerings, such as staff duress and patient elopement. For more information, please visit contact.io. In this episode, we are joined by Contact.io's healthcare expert, Kapil Asher, and Christine Cornyn, RNBSN. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Today's uh, podcast with Tech Nation is hosted by Contact.io. And the topic of discussion today is going to be how Biomed can be loved by your internal clients. And in this specific podcast, we're going to talk with nurse, uh, Christine Corning, uh, who has been a nurse in the past. Uh, The discussion is going to be between me and Christine. Um, and it's going to be a fun one. We're just going to discuss how uh, Biomed should look at nursing as their internal client, what uh, what the nurses want from Biomed, and how they can have a pretty strong relationship uh, that can be more effective towards patient care and the hospital efficiency in general. So it's going to be a fun one. Um, stay tuned in. And uh, hey, Christine, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Uh, you had a good weekend? I did. It was my birthday. So, you know, coming off a birthday weekend to record a part, to oh. do a podcast with you. <laughs> Related happy birthday. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, do you want to uh, kind of just give a little bit of an introduction, your background, your journey in healthcare, what has uh, made you land up in Contact IO so far? Sure, sure. One of the first questions I get from everybody when they find out that I'm in technology now is, why did you leave nursing? Um, and, you know, I don't feel like I left nursing. I feel like everything I've ever done in my in my career has really been around improving the nursing process and f- improving efficiencies um, and supporting the nurses in any way that we can with technology. Um, so even early, early on, before I had my license, I was at a, a, a private practice. And back then it was what they call them, the family doctors. It was a family doctors, um, very big, thriving organization. And they were doing a lot of things on paper, um, you know, writing down the results of people's cholesterol tests and sending them to them, mm-hmm. even if they're normal. Like they just, so they would put a stack of paper in front of me and I'd have to write the same note over and over to the, to the, uh, to the patients. And I, you know, I was like, this is crazy. Back then we had word perfect <laughs> for those of, I'm aging mm-hmm. myself, but so I created a, a sort of an automated mail merge that if there were normal results, we just fire off these messages and we could do it in bulk. And then yeah. um, it really just was my first foray into like, let's use technology to make things more efficient, work smarter, not harder, right? Um, there's no mm-hmm. need to be handwriting these these notes to every single patient who's come through the office. It was a pretty big volume. Um, and then, you know, it kind of evolved into really being very interested in how we can make things efficient, even as I continued through nursing school, as I continued um, at the bedside. And I I really covered the care continuum when I was working um, with patients. I was, as I said, in an ambulatory practice. 
I spent time in long-term care in med surge, mm -hmm. as well as the ICU um, and in home care. So I got to see a flavor of all of the different care areas and where the efficiencies yeah. really needed to, to kind of step up. Um, and in all of that time, when I was at the bedside and working with, with patients, I was also focused on technology. So if there was a committee for a new product, if there was a, a committee for you know learning how to make things more efficient, that was where I kind of always stepped in. Um, so from some examples are, you know, at the visiting nurses association, we went from paper to carrying laptops yeah. into the into the patients' houses, um, and and that was a big lift for these nurses that had been you know sort of doing no their notes. No pun intended. <laughs> The yeah, laptops it, were heavy back then. <laughs> they were heavy. They broke a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. But they, they, you know, they did bring that level of ability to communicate across the multidisciplinary team because we had the information we needed when we went in the house instead of waiting for Joni to get it out of her car on Wednesday. Um, so we had this information at our fingertips and really could provide more efficient and better care for our patients. So I was all on board with doing that. Um, it took a long time to pry the paper out of the nurse's hands and have them use the laptops, um, but it was mm -hmm. well worth it. And then, you know, from there, moving forward, I was, you know, all in on electronic medical records. And, and some of the nurses listening to this will probably hate me for this because now it's become you know, there are so many systems in health systems and there's so many applications that you have to log in and out of. It's become a little bit of a detriment where we're, we're mm -hmm. pulled away from the patient's bedside to, to, to kind of manage the technology. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about this conversation because I think we need to really look at how can we manage the technology, leverage it, um, and really create true efficiencies, not just different work. I think what we've done in right. the past, is we've created sort of a different amount of work that became a somewhat more administrative and pulled us away from the bedside. And that, right. that definitely um, pertains to, you know, looking for equipment and you know, all of these other, um, these other things that we're going to talk a little bit about today. Um, but I was, I'm, I'm lucky in that I had the, the ability to work from the paper to electronic to, you know, on the clinical side, as well as from a learning perspective, bringing people from instructor-led training and pulling them off the floor into e-learning, um, just always looking for that next thing that is is more more efficient and easier for the nurses. But my goal is always like, we don't want to give you yet another thing that you have to log into. We want it to be automated. Mm -hmm. We want it to be smart. Let's leverage AI. Let's leverage machine learning. And let's make sure that we can provide an environment that is going to enhance your practice and not hurt it. That's that's the ultimate right. goal. Right. That's awesome, Christine. Uh, and just for the viewers I'll, uh, or the listeners, I guess, uh, I'll give uh, my background a little bit. Uh, so I have been, um, so Kapil Asher, that's, um, uh, you know, my introduction. And I have been in kind of the RFID, RTLS space ever since graduation. So I graduated around 2006. And my first uh, job right out of college was working for a passive RFID company, which was not vertical centric. But I learned a lot about the technology of uh, putting a tracker on an object so that it can be tracked through various processes and uh, various flow, right? So the, the big things where RFID comes into place is always supply chain, uh, you know, uh, asset tracking. Uh, there's always been discussions around how to leverage RFID for uh, in improving eff efficiency in processes. Uh, so I've been always in, in that mode. And about, I would say, 10 or 15 years ago, I got pulled into healthcare. Uh, where uh, VA had put out a contract to enable RFID across their entire enterprise it was a heavy lift uh, because they wanted to track their assets across, uh, I think, 140 hospitals or so. And that's when I got put into this vertical. And ever, ever since then, I never looked back. And I feel like if RFID has a real use case that is in healthcare, there's uh, you know, of course, you can talk about supply chain, you can talk about so many other things, but the the true value that RFID can bring is really inside of a hospital uh, because hospitals are very unique. You know, hospitals are large footprint, uh, million square feet, uh, big uh, buildings, and uh, they have tens of thousands of assets, which are all critical, right? They're all critical. They're all expensive. When you need one, you just cannot spend time looking for one. You need it immediately. 
Uh, so what better um, use of the technology to find something inside of a massive building like that? Um, so I truly believe that this is the space for um, kind of RFID, RTLS to shine. And, and it's going to continue to do so for a really long time. And ever since I started my journey, the technology has evolved and changed uh, like, like any other technology, right? So if you look at the old technology of cell phones, they were big clunky devices. They used to, uh, you know, you travel a few uh, miles away from where you are and you drop the signal and, and it doesn't work anymore. Uh, to now, uh, you know, my Apple Watch can make a phone call if, it, if needed and it'll never drop, you know, it's, it's that amazing. So in the same way, even RFID, RTLS technologies have evolved significantly from the Gen 1 part. And I know every time I speak with uh, our audience, our Biomed, HTM our audience, they always say that they have a bad experience from the past because they tried something like this and it didn't work out very well for them. So my answer to them is uh, think about the cell phones. We were um, in that generation, did not work, very expensive, very cumbersome, but now we are in this modern era. We're in 2023 and technology has evolved significantly. It's become more cheaper, more easier to deploy. Uh, so give it another shot. Don't don't shy away from it from uh, from back in the day. Uh, so that's that's kind of my my background, my industry. That's that's kind of I, I don't know any other industry to be honest. This is where I've uh, spent most of my career, and I, I really love it. So it's going to be fun uh, seeing the next few years what it has to show. Yeah, and I think um, in healthcare, you know, we're so used to innovation. I mean, when you think of what medicine is, right? It's constantly evolving. We're constantly doing research, um, both on the actual diagnostic side of things, but as as well with technology. Um, when I was in, when I first started um, nursing, I had to count drips on an IV. You know, mm -hmm. um, smart pumps were coming. They were new. They were out there for more critical medications, but we didn't have them for every single every single patient. That would be crazy. They were so expensive. So you know, you right. still had to sit there and sort of time your time your drips uh, manually uh, to gravity. So I think, you know, when we look at, I think people are, they're not hesitant to take on technology. There has been such massive successes, but what they don't want to do is, is repeat mistakes of the past. So when we look at things right. like RTLS, if it went poorly before, we truly have to show them, look, look this is where we've evolved. This is how it's yeah. getting better. And I think, you know, let's take another look and see where are those new efficiencies that you're going to find where, it, you know, it's much easier. Where can we integrate? Where can we make things easier and keep those logins down? Correct. Correct. Uh, so, Christine, let's uh, talk a little bit about, of, you know, some challenges that we are facing in healthcare. I mean, those, no matter whether you are an IDN, whether you are a community regional hospital in the outskirts of Massachusetts or Boston, uh, I think these problems are uh, everywhere, uh, and I would like to highlight some of them just to, you know, level set what our discussion is going to be about and, and you know, chime in where you feel uh, necessary. But I, I feel like uh, when you specifically talk about assets uh, and medical devices in particular, uh, I think we still have the problem of a visibility, right? So um, when you when you buy, when let's say it's a new hospital, you buy a lot of equipment, a lot of medical devices to stock your hospital for patient care. Once you get them in, you program them as an HTM engineer and you send it out in the wild, uh, there is no visibility to where they are going. You know, they could be going a few patient rooms down the road, uh, down the hall, or it could be going 10 floors above. There's, there's no idea, right? Uh, and the problem is when you don't have that visibility, when you don't know that the nearest thing that you need is just a few uh, rooms away, uh, you waste a lot of time in trying to find them. Then as a result of not having to waste time, the easiest thing is to do is procure more. You know, you start with, the, let's say, uh, um, you know, 100 things, and then you uh, soon find out those 100 things are not going to, are not making you efficient. So you go and buy 50 more things thinking that that's going to help. Uh, but really that's just adding to the problem because now you're stuck with 50 more things that you didn't need and you have to go on with the maintenance for them uh, for eternity, right? So I always have uh, HTM environment engineers tell me the same problem. Like we have too many things. We just don't have the time to maintain them, fix them, 
update their software on a timely manner, uh, just because we have a lot of things. So my first question going back to them is, I don't think this is a productivity issue. This is an issue with over procurement. So do you mm-hmm. think that is the case? Have you seen that happen in your um, you know, journey before when you were a bedside nurse? Absolutely. You know, you think that we don't have enough, um, whether it's an IV pump or a pulse oximeter, you know, a mobile pulse oximeter. We don't have enough. We can't possibly, we have to buy more, we have to buy more. And then you find a stash of them somewhere. Um, so you mm-hmm. find out, and it happened during the pandemic. You know, we saw so many stories on the news of organizations that thought they didn't have enough ventilators. And then, oh my goodness, we have this whole warehouse with all these ventilators that we didn't, haven't been maintaining for the last, you know, year. So we can't use them. Um, it happened quite a bit. So I think, you know, that visibility piece is is key, especially for the more expensive equipment. But I saw it all the time. So we had we had an abundance of it. It wasn't in the right place. Um, right. You know, some, some of the areas of the hospitals are always tighter on their equipment and very good at it. You know, in the ICU, you, you know, you typically have, you know what you have and it's right there. But when you look at the larger floors with more diverse patient populations, like your med surge floors, um, that's where things get a little sticky and things move around or um, especially in the OR area, you know, the, that's all about movement. They're, they're going pre-op operation pack you. There's just a lot of movement of equipment that's going with that patient. So they end up looking around and realizing they don't have any equipment because it's all moved on with the patient through the process. Um, so yeah, we start all the time and you spend a ton of time running around looking for things. Um, it's a frustration to the nurses because it's not what they, they want to do. They want to take care of their patients. Um, it's a frustration to the patients because a lot of times it can you know do, do things like defer their ability to get discharged because they're waiting on something. Um, so right. it, it just a, it, it's always been a frustration. Um, and I think you know, hopefully we can move towards a, a better process. So- what what did you guys do when when these things were a challenge? And I'm sure uh, kind of RTLS was not on your mind uh, at that time as as a nurse. Uh, what did you do to solve that short term problem? Uh, did you complain about having to buy more? Can you share? I know it's a little, but can you share? Yeah, some it's, you know these are trade these are did? trade secrets. These are trade secrets. But we oftentimes yeah. we had hiding spots. Everybody had a hiding okay. spot for the things they need. <laughs> Okay. Any, um, yeah. any creative hiding spot you can think of, or you don't want to give ideas? I'm not to giving those away. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, it was typically, you know, always, you know, the, the clean utility room. We could kind of squirrel things away into the into the corners and, and hope that nobody saw them. Um, you know, we'd like yeah. to to definitely, you know, maintain protocol when it came to clean and dirty. But like you also wanted to put things just in, uh, you know, a, a patient room that's usually an observation room that maybe we're not using very often, so we can put them in there. Um, things like that. You just we would just kind of squirrel things away as we could because it made it easier. I know where it's going to be. I know I'm discharging a patient now. If I clean this device in two hours, I'm admitting another patient. I'll have it in my hands, right? So I'm not having to, mm-hmm. to put it back somewhere and someone else grab it. So you just kind of hold on to things. In in my case, a lot of times I would be discharging a patient, and that same room was going to be mine because we had a primary nursing model. So I would keep right. things in my like that's those are my rooms like all of my things are in there and as the patients turn yeah. over I, available to me i know it's it's kind of a turf war right you don't touch my equipment because it's mine and i'm going to just use it for my next patient so i mean we are laughing about it but the problem is not that uh nurses don't want to be helped by the support staff uh, of the hospitals but uh, it sometimes just the, goes back to visibility, right? So if you don't know where things are, where there might be a whole stash of things that you can grab, uh, mm-hmm. it's just easy to resort to such things of hiding and not trusting the system will give you what you need at, at the time that you need it, right? So uh, so this, this spirals often into an over-procurement model. Uh, so we hear horror stories, especially from Ivy Palm standpoint, where uh, it's two or three times more than what they need sometimes because it's it's just that the trust between the support staff, between biomed and the nurses is not established in a way uh, that will, um, you know, let the nurse have what they need at the time of need. Uh, and it just resorts to buying more things at all times. Um, so so that's, that's kind of a huge thing. And then the, the other one, and I don't know if you guys did this often, but um, rentals is a big thing, right? So to do a stop gap um, and, you know, maybe the CFO or the controller of the hospital is, is a smart uh, finance uh, administrator and they don't want to get into long-term uh, procurement uh, capital expenditures. 
So they might just do a short term rental to stop gap uh, that that shortage. Did you experience that? And you know, how did you deal with rentals so much? Honestly, as a staff nurse, we don't care if the if the you, equipment you didn't know. is purchased or rented or you know, and that also comes down to whether it's rented or owned, we're still going to hide it if we have to, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. So that's, I mean, then you have the issue of me of managing your rentals. I would, I probably wouldn't have known if it was a rental. That probably was a tag on the back that I didn't see. I didn't know what it meant. Um, I'm not yeah. sure if things have changed, but I, I, I was never trained to to be able to recognize the rental versus something we owned. It was just the equipment we had that we needed to to do our jobs and to make to, to give the best of care course. possible. So it didn't really matter to me and, where. It came from. And if you and if you did a patient transfer who was on a rental piece of equipment, it's not that you're going to pull that equipment out to make sure that no. it's not a rental. Right? No, we're not going to switch out the ventilator so that we can get an owned piece of equipment on. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> right. Right. And 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 that's that's rightfully so, right? Of course, you don't want to jeopardize your patient's health just to make sure that things are run in a certain manner. Um, so yeah, with with rentals also, we hear the same problem from from our HTM uh, audience that yeah, we we buy, I mean, we rent a lot of equipment, but then again, there is no visibility to it. We don't know where they are in a, any given time, and when the vendor comes to pick it back up, um, they have no idea, and and they just keep racking fees more and more. And I've heard things like they spend twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month, not not a year, a month just oh, because wow. they were not able to find uh, the equipment that needs to go back to the vendor, right? Uh, so, you know, from a nurse's perspective, I think knowing all of these things matter, but at the same time, I don't know what you can do as a nurse to uh, solve for that problem without technology, without improvement in visibility, right? Right, exactly. I don't yeah. think you can do all the training in the world. I don't think that the nurses are going to change their practice based on whether or not equipment is rented or owned or where it's supposed to be. They're just going to grab it when they can and use it for what they need. Right. right, correct. Uh, so that's 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 great. I think uh, one other problem which has uh, been surfaced, and, and this is also not new, this has been, you know, the, the challenges that we are discussing are not new. They've been around for a really long time. It's just that people have not figured out the holy grail to solve them in a in a manner that is sustainable for the future right um so did you ever face uh, things like losing heart monitors telepacks uh because of kind of evs turnovers and nobody paid attention to the devices did that happen with you yeah, that happened quite a bit because especially when I was on a telemetry floor and those packs, you know, they get wrapped up in the laundry and they get sort of cleaned up all at once with when when house could we're, we're trying to turn these rooms over very quickly. So housekeeping comes in and they do a quick sweep. And if that te telemetry pack is still in the bed um, after the patient got discharged, it, it's it's going to be gone. <laughs> um, yeah. A lot of things and a lot of the smaller and things are getting smaller and smaller. Right. So the telemetry packs are getting very, very small. Um, you know, things like uh, the um, oximeters, you know, bedside bedside diagnostic equipment. It's all getting smaller over time, which is just creating a, a sort of a bigger problem because it's easier to misplace. Um, so I think uh, that's always been an issue. Uh, we tried to catch it as much as we could, and we had some, you know, lots and lots of training around that, making sure that there was nothing, you know, that we're leaving in the room behind or is going home with the patient accidentally that they think they can bring home with them. Um, so there, there was a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that that's another another big one that's been an issue for a long time, and. You know, from from HTM, and and I think this goes back to even the nursing, how they spend their time. Uh, you know, we talk about right now. I think McKinsey has set up a report which shows how six to eight percent of the nurses shift. Um, you know, in a twelve-hour uh, time span, is spent in hunting and gathering. Mm -hmm. uh, did this, did you think if there was a tool that would help you find uh, the equipment in a faster manner, but required you to log into another system, is going to help that or is it going to make it worse? What do you think? So my my thought on that, and again, I, I love technology. I, I've been in, involved in technology as it's evolved with healthcare, and but the login situation is a real problem or learning new software. 
if everything doesn't have a similar or same user interface, then it's just something else that they have to, to learn. And it takes yet another few minutes away from the patient. Um, when you think about it, if you put it outside of, of healthcare and put it in layman's term, imagine you get a phone call from a family member. It's an emergency call and they say, hey, I need you to come pick me up right away because whatever happened. You go outside and your car is either not there or not functioning. Now you can't get to your family member very quickly. So what do you do? You're like, okay, let me call an Uber or a Lyft. And I go to my phone and have to log in. Well, I haven't used Lyft in three months, so I can't remember my password. Let me reset my password. Oh, right. I can't remember how that authenticates. It goes back. We do this with everything every day, right? With the passwords to get lost. So now I have to go through right. my authentication process. My family member's still in duress. They're waiting. They're in distress. There's something going on with them. And I'm trying to figure out how to get an Uber. Oh, fun fact, it is an off time. So Uber's not really available. Think about your midnight shift. Biomed's not there right. at night, they're on call. So now you yeah. have this You have this situation where you're like, okay, I'll get there as soon as I can, as soon as I find an Uber that may or may not show up for me to get to you. And it all comes down to you know the process. If, if we have to log in and remember a password or reset a password or figure out even which system it is. Um, you know, sometimes you forget the name of it. If there's a, a name of the, the RTLS system that you use twice a month, you're not gonna remember what it is. What am I supposed to be logging into? Um, it just becomes another roadblock in providing that, that you know, high quality care that you want to. Um, and, and, mm -hmm. and to me, that's the, that's the hardest part. I love technology, but I don't want to provide yet another technology that you have to remember how to use. So it should be something right. that is smart and automatic to to these um, to the clinicians. Right, and and even from from your early days of nursing, uh, you know, even if you put RTLS aside for a little bit, everything has kind of. You said there were paper trails before, then it became EMR, mm -hmm. which was a learning curve. And then I'm sure there are other systems like a ticketing system. You want to call the help desk, which was used to be a phone call. And now it's a, it's some mm -hmm. sort of an online method of doing uh, help desk questions. Uh, so there's technology involved in pretty much everything you guys do uh, from a patient care standpoint. Very similar to how you mentioned in our day-to-day -day life, everything is on apps now, right? Uh, so I, I, I feel like the if you want RTLS to be more effective and helpful to the nurses, uh, it cannot be yet another system that has to be uh, looked at, right? Uh, so here's where you can think about integration. So if you are using EMR predominantly for your uh, work, uh, maybe having the location of equipment for your specific patient care is part of that EMR feed, uh, then you know it's one step less for you. You, you can get that done quite easily. Uh, then the other example that comes to my mind, and I love this because I use it all the time, is uh, when we were kids, you know, you, you didn't think about how uh, laundry, your dirty laundry was, you know, getting cleaned and put back into your closet. And I'm, you know, I'm talking like a spoiled child <laughs> when I was a kid, but I, but I think if anyone deserves to be a spoiled kid are the nurses because they do so much for our community and, and patient care, right? Uh, but every morning I woke up for school and there was the clean laundry over there and I could just use it and, and get to my day. Uh, I never thought about how in the background this this cycle was happening, right? Um, and in the same way, I feel like a, a real-time uh, location sensing technology can provide that experience to the nurse where when you need something, it's there. How it happened does not concern the nurse, Right. Uh, so if you, let's take simple example, like IV pumps, you need clean IV pumps to help with your patient. Uh, and you go to a designated clean storage area. And no matter what time of the day you go, there is pumps for you to grab. They are clean. They're ready to go. They are in a perfect condition. Uh, and then when you are done, you just roll it back to that laundry basket, you know, the soil room. You just put mm -hmm. it in the soil room and then someone will come and pick it up clean it, reprocess it, and bring it back to the clean storage. So if that were the, the kind of the experience we are providing to the nurses, do you think they will adopt and, uh, and go with the program if that's the Absolutely. level of service we give them? Yeah, I mean, because that's not really even an adoption issue, right? It's just a matter of trust. I trust that every time I go into the soil, I mean, the clean utility room, what I need is going to be there. And a lot of times it's the more obscure things. Maybe it's, you know, something for lifting patients or a safety device for 
for the nurses to make sure they're not hurting themselves ergonomically, or maybe it is a piece of a medical equipment. But if I know that we have a process in place that that is going to be there when I need it, then yes, I'm going to start trusting trusting the system. Um, you know, and and it kind of goes back to when we first started automating medication, right? Medication dispensal. There was a, there was a lot yeah. of you know distrust around having to log into a, a Pixis machine or one of the other brands and having to, and trusting that it was going to be there when I needed it. I'm going to get a pain med for my patient. Um, and now there's just this machine I have to log into. But then over time we got very very used to it and it became you know just part of our daily routine and we trusted that pharmacy was going to have everything we needed in those drawers in the right spots at the time we needed them and it just became something that we were used to and i think that's where we need to be with equipment as well like we need to trust that it's going to be there and that we're not going to have to run around looking for it that way we will put everything back in the soiled room because we know it's going to be cleaned and those those levels are going to be maintained where i can go and grab what i need and you think that will help with reducing the hoarding i i don't oh, know yeah. if that is a good word to use but the hideout yeah. spots and all that will clean get cleaned up. You think after a few months is that? I do think so. I I really do, and I, you know I have heard that 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 does happen. You know when people put things in place where where there's a that trust is built, then they stop kind of holding on to things in their own areas, yeah. which is yeah. Also, it's getting yeah. harder and harder to hide things. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. So. I think yeah, this this is this is amazing. I think this is the kind of discussion we don't have enough. I feel like I don't think there is a, a a meeting, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. You worked in healthcare settings longer than I have, but do you think there is uh, there are meetings happening between the support staff and the nursing leaders uh, to kind of come up with a process to help? You know, using technology, right? Mm -hmm. Using technology, do you think there is, uh, they come together and talk about these processes uh, of what is going to help them? I think it depends on the organization. I think a lot of it really needs to be top down. There needs to be a lot of um, support at the executive and the leadership level to make sure that these these systems are put in place, but they're not just thrown in like reactively to solve a problem, that there's really a lot of thought put into how is it going to affect the workflow of the clinicians? Um, how is it going to affect the experience of the patients? If it's not going to improve the workflow, if it's not going to affect, it's not going to positively affect our patient experience, then don't do it. You know, don't put technology in place for the sake of technology. But what we're talking about today is happening in the background. I don't have to log into anything. I just know when I go to grab what I need, it's there. You know, that, of course, is something that there should be massive support around. And it has to be explained that way. It has to be, you know, very, very transparent to the to the staff. This is why we're putting this in place. And this is how easy it's going to be for you. And we're trying to consolidate right. to your EMR or into your primary area of work so that you're not logging into yet another system. Right. And I, and I think I my experience is the same thing. I've, I've been working very closely with uh, with HTM departments in various hospitals. So I was, before I became, uh, you know, I came into sales, I was more on the professional services side of things. And I sat alongside with HTMs, helping them, you know, uh, do the tagging of the equipment for the asset trackers, or, you know, maybe help them with uh, doing software upgrades and th things of that nature. And, and every time I heard uh, the the HTMs say nurses don't get it. You know this is this is such a hard job for us, and we we are trying to make sure that we are giving them enough uh, service that they deserve. But at the same time, if they don't keep their end of the bargain, all of this goes to waste, and you know we are not able to help them uh, support it, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And yes, technology is is going to help them. Technology is going to automate certain things for them. But if if the the consumers of the technology don't do their part, then no technology can help them, right? So, so you know, think of uh, think of uh, Waze. Waze is kind of a, a a navigation software on your lap, on your iOS device or Android device, and it tells you things about potholes. It tells you things about uh, you know, there's a you know a, a police officer three miles ahead who's waiting to give mm -hmm. you a ticket. And those are kind of uh, user participated uh, data points, right? Uh, and you know, it's it doesn't translate exactly to what I'm trying to say, but there is user participation required to 
successfully make that an app that your consumer will use. Uh, it's the same thing with with real time location sensing. If if you're uh, if you're not playing a role of what you should be doing, uh, then the technology can be as automated as possible, but it'll still not work for for what you're trying to do. So, so yeah, no, I, I like this uh, the like like this conversation how it's going. Uh, just from a biomed standpoint, I want to highlight a few other things, right? So there's this whole um, notion of preventative maintenance uh, versus alternative equipment maintenance. Are you familiar with any of that? Do you do you know what that means from a nursing standpoint? Or I know from a from a sales uh, executive at Contact IO, you might know what it is. But from a nursing, do you know what that means? No, I knew that everything, every piece of equipment had to have a scheduled maintenance or sometimes it's collaborate, uh, calibration, whatever it might be that has to be done to the equipment. Um, and there usually was a sticker with a date on it. Sometimes I knew what that date meant, sometimes I didn't. Um, so I wasn't really involved in that piece. Again, we just, we want it to be there and we want it to be working. So, um, I, you know, I do think that I, there wasn't an awareness of those technicians that were coming up and making things work for us, which I think there really should be. There needs to be more yeah. of a collaborative approach to understanding, you know, what is it that these engineers are doing for us um, and, and, and appreciation there, quite honestly, because I don't know that there's that visibility into everybody. Everybody's very much in their own role um, and, and doing what they do every day. And sometimes you don't see the bigger picture of like what is going into all of that support and, and um, providing you with the tools that you need. So I think having kind of stepped out and, and looked at things from a, a different perspective, um, it, it has shown me that, oh, wow, like there's a lot of work in the background that's happening that you just don't even know about. Um, and it, I think right. it's really important that we we recognize everybody that's involved. You know, you think about a movie, everybody knows who the actors are, but there's, you know, probably a thousand people in the background that are making that happen. And I think it's right. important that we recognize everybody on the crew, not just, you know, just not just the folks that are on screen. So I think um, I didn't know. And, and, and honestly, every, right. every time I hear it, I'm like, I feel a little bad. Like, I didn't know that this is all happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's right. I mean, you you may have gone through one of your days where you see a stressful biomed engineer trying to grab equipment from you because mm -hmm. it's an EM due. Uh, and you know, if if the preventive maintenance is not done uh, in the right manner uh, or at the right time, then you know, joint commission walks in, they see a, a device that's not calibrated or doesn't have a fresh sticker on it. And that could mean a lot of bad things for the whole organization, right? Mm -hmm. So again, it goes back to the team effort. You know, you have to trust each other. If if the engineer is asking you for the device, it's because there is a reason. It's not mm -hmm. like they want to take it home and you know, uh, you know, whatever with it, right? So uh, the the other thing I want to say, and this is more, I, I don't think nurses would ever participate in in this kind of discussion, but there is a notion of. Uh, avoiding doing preventative maintenance on a cycle because not every piece of equipment is utilized at the same rate as each other. Uh, similar to your car, right? Your, your car, if, if it has a sticker for, a, for a maintenance, uh, and even if it's been sitting in the parking lot and being used only for 500 miles, let's say in a year, you still have to go and check it out and do the oil change and things like that. But now the modernized way of, thinking about maintenance is doing it by the utilization of the device, not by a set schedule of the day. Uh, now, if you think about AI, machine learning, there's ton of data that we collect on the equipment itself uh, to know their actual usage status. Uh, so if, if we collect that data, we can spread out the maintenance cycles more, um, uh, more further away and and improve the productivity of our engineers, right? So they don't have to worry about running around finding the same equipment again and again. Uh, and RTLS gives you that. So RTLS can tell you the usage status of every device just by the base basis of its location, uh, and then it can proactively suggest you which one needs to be maintained more than the other. And at the same time, we can load balance the utilization of all the devices as well. So not one device is utilized, being utilized a lot more than the other. So if we load balance everything so that they all are, uh, are, are you know, the, we can delay the maintenance cycle a little further away, 
it's going to be beneficial for the whole fleet uh, in general. And once again, it's nothing to do with nurses. I don't think you would ever care about it, but uh, I'm just saying what the modernized notion is. Um, so I know we are we're almost at the top of our time. I, 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 I'm going to give a few of my key takeaways from this whole discussion, and then maybe you can add on if, if uh, you feel there is some things you want to input. Uh, but I, I, I think what I'm gathering from you as, as a nurse, as a bedside nurse, is you don't, you're not necessarily looking for another tool uh, to help you get more efficient because there is enough on your plate from a digitization standpoint, from, uh, from, a, from software standpoint, that adding one more thing might just become counterproductive. Uh, in 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 uh, specifically from an equipment uh, gathering standpoint, you want something that they are stationed in designated locations, and then there is a background system that uh, kind of monitors the power levels of all these things. And once the power levels fall below a certain threshold, you know they can be restocked, and the restocking happens from a support staff member like a biomed or a supply chain person. And, and you just want to grab what you need and go about your way and, and send it back to the soil room once, once you're done. Uh, is that a true assessment? Yes, absolutely. Anything we can do just to make it in the flow of work, not another you know left turn into another system that we have to deal with, I think is is the key. Making it, you know, keep everything within the same flow of work so that you're not having to learn something else. You're not having to remember another system, especially logins. Um, I think that's kind of the, the key to all of this. Awesome. And I think the, the modern, uh, modern RDLS systems are, are more open integration format, right? So, of course, there are apps that are, are helping with the power level management, that are helping with the searchability. Uh, they're helping with uh, the utilization status, the usage status of all the devices. And, oh, by the way, they can also integrate data into the existing systems that the nurses are used to using, like the EMR. Uh, or even from a biomed standpoint, the computerized materials management system, CMMS systems. If, if the data is flowing to all the systems that are, that are um, being utilized on a daily basis anyways for other purposes, then I think the adoption would be much more than having to log into a third system. So uh, I, I love that assessment. Um, do you think this will help with improving the relationship between nurses and the support staff? What do you Absolutely. think? Absolutely. Yeah, I really do. I think that, you know, again, it comes back to trust, trusting that the, the what they need is going to be where it is when they need it. And then the other piece is, is taking off the nurse hat, looking at looking at data. Data is so important we'll have the right amount of equipment if we have the information and can analyze what's in place, right? So I think a lot of times we didn't have enough because we couldn't articulate where the gaps were, you know, why it was that something wasn't there when we went to get it. Or in it. And I think having the actual data around how much time we're spending away from the patient looking for things um, will help to even reconfigure how the, the floor might be designed or where equipment is stored. So I think there's a lot of information, you know, we didn't even touch on all of that, you know, the analysis that can go on behind the scenes here, but I think it's really important um, because ultimately it's, again, going to help with that patient experience and with the care of those, with those patients. Amazing. Uh, thanks, Christine. I really enjoyed our conversation today. I hope you felt the same way. Uh, mm -hmm. Next time you... Next time you meet someone from the biomed uh, <laughs> service, I will shake please your hand. <laughs> shake, shake, shake their hand, thank them for the service. And I hope uh, you get the same kind of respect and, you know, which nurses deserve. Uh, I mean, nurses and teachers, I, I don't, you know, they need to be respected in every, every minute of the day, I feel like. Uh, so I hope that continues to happen. Um, and hopefully we'll do another podcast uh, on a separate topic later. Sounds good. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Capel and Christine, for a great presentation. If you enjoyed today's episode, you might enjoy our ongoing webinar series, Webinar Wednesday. You can find a calendar of upcoming live webinars, as well as an archive of on-demand webinars at webinarwednesday.live.
To obtain your certificate for one CE credit from the ACI, please remember to complete and submit the survey form located below this podcast title. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com.